when, when we, we met last time and you were showing me some of your presentation that you were making and there was that hustle page and you said this was this was the culture at Johnson Hill. This is how we did things. And I, I'd like to have you explain the culture and the, the selling through hard times and just kind of encapsulate the culture that you had at Johnson Hill at its finest when you were really, really making things, some things happen. We, um, we got up every morning with the attitude that we, uh, we needed to succeed. And if we weren't succeeding, we needed to change things. And we were very oriented to making changes and sometimes even premature, maybe. Uh, but in the long run, that attitude served us well. Uh, if you ha see an issue, deal with it. Whether that be a person or a, uh, a, a physical problem or, or a decline in a, with a publication. If a publication wasn't making its numbers, uh, it didn't take us long to, to make some changes whether editorially or we'd go to the marketplace and maybe identify the top 10 or 15 advertisers and, um, and talk to them personally and find out what was on their mind. And if we made this change or that change, would they endorse it? And uh, using their input and that philosophy paid big dividends. And we used it to launch new magazines. Uh, we launched a publication in the aviation market and we had orders from the top 20 advertisers, potential advertisers, pretty much in line before we put the first issue out because we went to the market with an idea and we got a buy-in from the leaders in the market on that idea before we put our dollar on the table and actually published the first issue. But that philosophy uh, was uh, permeated both divisions, take action and do something. Get up in the morning and do something. Right, right. I, and it, it, I, you, you helped us a great deal during that period as, as a strategic planning facilitator and it put, brought a, a discipline to our company that I'll admit wasn't there prior. Did, did, was strategic planning did a big part of Johnson Hill and that's how you got exposed to that skill that, that you brought to the table? We had a professional planner that came in and worked with our company. And uh, that was when I was really exposed to the whole concept. And he was excellent. And he, worked, he had a good personality and worked with our people very well. And um, that would be accurate. Um, and we were growing so fast, we spent a lot of time recruiting and training and uh, trying to get all the staff, uh, everything staffed. We grew 40% one year. And uh, um, getting staff in place and uh, getting them ingrained in our, in our culture and then producing. And uh, we had some false starts in that process because it had to happen so fast. So we have a lot of newcomers that only a, a lot only know farm equipment under the lesser media. It's been 20 years now. What do you think that the dealers and manufacturers of today's area era uh, might not realize about what farm equipment had been 30 years ago, 40 years ago? What, what would be what would be some of the the differences that in in the magazine then versus now? Okay, well, I have an anecdote. It was my first introduction to that to that magazine. I was either at DeKalb in my last year, or I was at the associate uh, the Ag Associates in the first year. I was attending a NAMA convention in Chicago, and it was a tough market. And I was sitting with some people from the farm, Prairie Farmer and the owner and publisher of uh, Feed and Farm Equipment had put copies of his magazine on all the tables at that NAMA meeting. And after dinner, they were commiserating about dif how difficult the market was at that time. And uh, uh, one of the top salesmen at Prairie Farmer 
picked up his his um, um, the, the copy of Feed and Farm Equipment, and he said, it, we might have it tough in our marketplace, but how would you like to be selling this? Yeah. And as if it were like a dirty diaper. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, he said, I mean, by, by comparison. Well, that was before it was sold to Jonathan at, uh, at Johnson Hill Press. And, but it speaks to where it started. It was uh, strictly product news. We didn't change the format that much. We were still product news. We believe in new products. And um, we didn't, but we didn't uh, do a lot of the circulation and ed editorial things that needed to be addressed to make it more significant in the, in, in the marketplace. And uh, so until we did that, we were just a, a, a hanger on in the marketplace and not viewed seriously. But once we put editorial and credible circulation in place, it became a different, a different animal. And uh, we got some credibility and, uh, and, and then you took it, you've taken it to the next level. Tell me, um, tell me about, I, I believe I met you about 1990 for, or so for the first time. And then I, I went to Chicago. I think you called on my dad in the summer or winter came to that old, old office. Um, so I think I met you about 1991, somewhere in there. And then, um, I did my own thing in Chicago, came back and I, I reacquainted with you almost immediately upon coming back to the family business. But I'd like to, to have you talk about you and my dad and when you met and how, how long you, you've known one another and kind of that first meeting and, and what developed with, between the two of you over the years. I was at DeKalb in, in a PR role and uh, was trying to get a visibility for our products wherever I could get it. And uh, I called on, on magazines and I called on Lee Shans. Mm -hmm. And uh, your dad was working for Lee Shans. Who, who my dad says is his greatest mentor right. in, his, in the business. Right. Yeah. And, um, and I met Roy Ryman um, around that time. And then um, I needed to have some field work done. And uh, Roy Ryman did some of that field work when he broke off. And in that conversation, he said that uh, your dad, Frank Lesseter, was one of the most uh, prolific and productive ag writers in the marketplace. And that's, that was in the back of my mind. And uh, so uh, as your dad evolved in, in, in different positions, uh, that always was on my mind. We tried to hire him at Johnson Hill Press at one time, and uh, he chose not to come. And that probably was a good decision uh, at the time for him. But um, after meeting him, I had a natural, uh, I like him as uh, I, I respected him professionally. And another man that I respected said, he's, he's the best there is in this business. He's a real wordsmith. And uh, uh, he doesn't like that word, by the way. He doesn't like that. <laughs> but I know what you're saying. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, he, Roy said, uh, Frank Lesseter can write more good copy in a given hour's time than anybody else he knew, more good ad copy. Yeah. And I think that's the fact. Yeah. So when I uh, was no longer involved at Johnson Hill Press and my client was, uh, my, was Badger Press, I felt that they should expand their their marketing reach and sales reach eastward. They were focused on the Jefferson County and, and the Madison area. And so uh, I made it my job to uh, meet or re re reacquaint with, uh, with Frank at Lester Publications and to get a young person involved in calling eastward toward Milwaukee out of Fort Atkinson. And uh, so that's when we got reacquainted and I became more familiar with uh, today, what, what, what was at that time, Lesseter Publishing. And then it, it developed from there. And your dad was always very proud of what you had accomplished, but wanted you in the family business. And um, 
I did sense that that business was going to be a little bit tight for uh, for for um, the two of you, and it just seemed when when farm equipment came up, that was an opportunity that had to happen. Yeah. Well, that that whole thing was a major blessing for our business and for me personally, and, and as a result, my dad personally. Could you tell us that that story? I, I remember it, but I'd like to hear it in your, your words and you can be candid about our, our pig headedness about, <laughs> about how things went there. Well, one morning I woke up to the phone, uh, phone visit from Jim Rank and he said that uh, Cygnus in their wisdom have decided they're going to either sell or close down Farm Equipment Magazine. And he said, this, you know, this is the wrong time and, and, uh, he doesn't understand it, and he needed to visit with me in more detail. So I met with Jim to get a, a fill-in on what was taking place, and it didn't make sense to either one of us. And I said, but if it's for sale, uh, I thought for maybe a fleeting moment that my, I should get back into the publishing business, but I didn't really want to do a startup with the circulation and the editorial and all of the things that didn't make sense for me at that point in my life. And so I was calling on Frank and I knew that you had just come up and I knew the circumstances at Lesseter pretty well. And I thought, well, this could be a real good fit with their no-till uh, magazine. And so I came to you and I, I made the pitch. I said, uh, this is an opportunity because it's a good title and uh, Jim knows how to sell. He probably would come with it if, if you chose to have him. And um, I think you can buy it right because they just wanted to unload at the time. And um, that first visit didn't, <laughs> didn't, <laughs> didn't ring the bell. Yeah. At, uh, we at weren't Boston. listening right, I guess. Yeah. Anyway, um, so I think a, a week or two passed, and Jim and I talked again, and I called Frank again. I said, we need to talk. And I became more impassioned about this opportunity. And I said, you know, talk to Rich. He's ready to do something. He's got to do something. He's committed to it. And this is an opportunity. I wasn't sure of the number, but I knew he had a very attractive number on it at the time. And then when he started negotiating and I found out the number, well, it was a, it was a steal. It was a bargain. And he respond, you and he responded and bought it and the rest is history. You've done beautiful things with that magazine. Mm -hmm.